the obstacles has been this type of rationality as exemplified by the mutakallimun and the fukaha to some extent. So we hear something similar from you today, so which is an important theme. Maybe we can only hear it in Iran. If we go to the Arab world or you go to Southeast Asia or you go to the subcontinent, India, you're going to hear how great the Sharia and the fukaha are. Of course, Sharia is necessary, we do not say, but it's not everything. We don't want to talk about so that for you would get a completely different view, okay? But here we're getting the other view. Let's remember that. It's important. You don't hear it very often, expressed so clearly and eloquently in English for our benefit. Alhamdulillah. I personally am conflicted about Ghazali. As you know, he has other books. If you read his Usul work, Al Mustasfa, which also is a very late work, the first 50 pages are a precis of Aristotelian logic, which he said this is a necessary tool for us to know in order to be good fukaha and usulis. But if you don't want to read it, skip over it and go to chapter one. And in other words, he's introducing an aspect, a fundamental tool of philosophy into kalam and into usul al-fiqh. So although he might have, for means of self-protection, attacked philosophy and made takfir against them, for means of self-protection, as a good asharite, he was breaking ranks. If he was too obvious about it, it would be a kind of intellectual suicide. So he had to be careful. Maybe that was one reason. It's complex. And there's also the, the other works of his in which he's much more open to Avicinian ideas. And you know that his uh, adoption of the rational soul psychology of Avicenna is fundamental to many of his works, like Mishkat al-Anwar and his whole esoteric tasawwuf, that you can't understand him without understanding that he accepted important elements of philosophy. And he, that's what actually gave tasawwuf in metaphysics. Although Agha Shaharam said Ibn Arabi was the great metaphysician, I think uh, that Ibn Arabi followed in the footsteps of Al Ghazali in developing. Yeah, no doubt he, for example, in a certain, he can be compared to Kant. Kant, I mean, there's a dispute about Kant. Whether he was against metaphysics or was a founder of a new metaphysics. Some people consider him to be a founder, real founder of a new Ghazali metaphysics. But in any case, I want, I, I'm not uh, answering, but, but uh, in Ghazali, he was a founder in a sense. For example, his Meshkat al-Anwar. His Meshkat al-Anwar is really, his Meshkat al-Anwar is, I mean, you find all Surawali there. But he was not able to found it himself. He just presented for example, his definition of light, the Vahirun Lizate, Mudhirun Gaira, is the same definition in Surah His classification of degrees of light, physical light, and uh, let's say spiritual light, and light, so and so. And also the difference, he gives about 15 or more differences between physical light and spiritual light. And strangely enough, in the commentary, of the Surah to Nur, Fakhri Razi. Fakhri Razi. Commentary on Mishkat al Anwar? Pardon? Commentary on Mishkat al Anwar? Yeah, yeah, he has a commentary on it. He has quoted, has amplified him. He said that Ghazali has given 15 differences. I give 50. <laughs> and they are very, very interesting. Some of them, of course, are fabricated, but some of them are very, very interesting. So, yes, yes, we're on. And Surah to Nur, Surah to Nur. Surah to Nur, he has given, he has uh, mentioned all the very positive points of Meshkat al Anwar. He said that praised him very much. He said that this is not enough. I say so, and he has added many arguments, the differences between physical light and also as amplified in Tafsir Surah to Nur. But in any case, he was very great, I do not deny. He was very great. He said, yeah, I like very much other books. But this problem only. You see, a person great, his sins are grave also. This excommunication I never, I mean, it's very heavy for me to accept. Why a person as Ghazali has takfir is very bad. Now, what Ibn Arabi does, Ibn Arabi never makes takfir. He's very polite. He, without mentioning Avicenna, he uses his terminology. For example, he uses Wujub emkanis belongs to Farabi and Avicenna, nobody else. Wajibul wujud, mumkin wujud. 
And he mentions, without mentioning Avicenna, Burhanu Siddiqin, ontological proof which only Avicenna has given. But he says it's very true, but it's not enough. You can get it only through kashf, not true. And it's true. He said you can conceptually, yes, that's true. But only, he has this very good discussion in his writings, that this ontological is only can be first you should prove already the existence of God and the ontological proof is for awliya and only through cash and it's, but there's very high respect and of course he criticizes Ghazali at some points Ibn Arabi, Ibn Arabi. it is very common but takfir I mean takfir in three books this is very and especially in our present situation in the world you see we never need mukaffir Mukaffir we do not need, except a person is kafir, really. Not a Muslim who says, prays and, let's say, reads the Qur'an. And, of course, uh, Avicenna wrote commentaries of the Qur'an. I mean, some of commentaries are attributed to him. And, uh, let's say, uh, his uh, commentary on, uh, let's say, the end of Isharat al-Tanbihat on Urafa is very marvelous, very marvelous. You cannot say that he was a disbeliever. It's very difficult for me to ask. What, what is, do you know what is the answer? What is the answer of Ibn Rushd? Addressing Ghazali as faqih. He said, you're a very great faqih. You are a mujtahid. And quoting a hadith of Prophet, al-mujtahid in ijtahada wa'asab falahu ajran wa'an ijtahada wa'akhta falahu ajran wa'ahir. A mujtahid who does his ijtahad. If it is right in his ijtahad, he has two rewards. One for his ijtahad, and what? Because his ijtahad is true, has come true. But if he makes an ijtahad, and he's wrong, and he's wrong, he has still a reward for his ijtahad, because he was a mujtahid. He says in philosophy it's the case, Philosophy is mujtahid, you are mujtahid in faith, we are mujtahid in intellectual matters. Of course, we might make mistakes, but this does not make us kafir. See, this is the answer, one of the answers Ibn, Arab, Ibn Rushd gives, and it's, I think, quite true. They are mujtahid. Finally, I thought all the observations you made about the enlightenment stage of intellectual activity Descartes, Kant, are very significant and important and, and, and enlightening and uh, it helped clarify many things for me. I thank you personally very much because I think this is something fresh and important for Muslims to hear. There's a tendency for Muslim intellectuals, if they pay the price of effort and uh, struggle to learn enough about these subjects and become, so sit at the feet of the European thinkers they tend to idolize them a little bit and to think that they're the great founders of modernity and the leaders of intellectual, rational, scientific progress. And they're a little bit blinded by the image that is projected around them. And they don't see through them enough to see how uh, negative the impact of Europe has been spiritually and intellectually on the whole world. Because it's modern Europe and the Enlightenment and positivism uh, spread through colonialism and cemented in place by capitalism, which is now determining our reality and our present day situation. And if we're not aware of that enough, we tend to give it a certain type of legitimacy because of its powerfulness, its spread, and its uh, omnipresence. And we think that therefore it must be correct or must be good or must be true, because otherwise it wouldn't be ruling everything, and including having armies in the middle of Asia. Now, uh, I think it's good for us to wake up from this illusion. We yes, need to be yes, shaken yes, awake from yes. this. And it's not just most... From this dogmatic slumber, no. as Kant yeah. said. My final uh, little point, I mean, I, I would like to ask you many questions. Yes, I, I, How I, do you assess the Mu'tazila, therefore? Mu'tazila. If you don't like the Asharites for their Cartesian view of knowledge, if you will, how about the Mu'tazila? Were they closer to a true intellectuality which you would prefer, or did they have their own blind spot? They're mutikallem. Mutikallem. 
wants either to refute or accept. They were not voluntarists, were they? They're mutikallim. Mutikallim, rational mutikallim, but in any case, Prophet was not a mutikallim, was not a faqih, was a prophet. Imam Ali Ja'far al-Sadiq was not a faqih in the modern sense. Of course, he knew fair. But if you want to, he was not even, even a mutikallim. He was an imam in ma'arif, in divine ma'arif, in divine ma'arif. You see, religion is not in need of so much disputation and things like that. I mean, the Quran has made it very clear for, for us. The methodology of Quran is very, very clear. We should follow. I mean, whatever, whoever follows the methodology of Quran should be respected. Ud'u ila rabbika. Your invitation to God should be like this. Ud'u, your da'wah. Bil hikmah. First hikmah. What is hikmah? Philosophers have been more close to hikmah. Orafa has been very close to hikmah. It comes first. The way of Mutakalims is not hikmah. It's not hikmah. Of course, you have very, very good points. You can feel very nice books. You can write. If you take the Mughni of Ghazi Abdul Jabbar, which 25 volumes have been found, and it has been more than 100 volumes, you could fill a library. But that's very good for academic work for scholarship and things like that. But what for Islam? See, for Islam is hikmah. It's not even a formal hikmah, an intrinsic hikmah, a divine hikmah, which opens the eye of the heart, the eye of the spirit, the eye of the spirit. If you read Molana, sometimes he awakens you. Sometimes I've been reading Molana, that is Rumi or Ibn Arabi, and suddenly, I mean, reading something has awakened me. See, there are find plenty of verses. Even if when he is reprimanding and rebuking, he is awakening you. See. So there should be an inner enlightenment. We need more light, not more disputation, not more formal. We, might, we need more light, divine light, divine guidance, divine guidance, really. This is something not only in Islam, all religions need. Not, and this is not the case with Islam, with all religions. We need more divine light, you see. And I think, Muslim sages have moved through divine light. If you read, for example, the works of Mullah Sadra, his usul kafi his Asfar, for example, he has points in it, many points, when you reflect on that. And they have been living with the Quran. They think that, for example, a person like Mullah Sadra knew Quran by heart, knew all the traditions by heart. And he had imbibed the gist imbibe the gist of the Quran, not only to read. So, I mean, Haji Mullah Sarzavari was like that. Our sages were some of them we had seen in Tehran, even if, I mean, the students of those sages who lived around Tehran. Tehran has been called the city of thousand sages, as Istanbul has been called the city of thousand mosques. There were thousand sages, some books have been written. You see, if you read traditional sages, you see light in them, in their speech, in their behavior, in their character, you see. Some light and their speech even, it was awakening. And they had not only read, let's say, this book or that book, they had the world view, they lived in that, you see. Nowadays they say that I've read this book or read this book, and philosophy is not reading books only. I'm reading F traditional philosophy is realization. They've realized to a certain extent, more or less, of course, they're rather than realized. I mean, to live with philosophy, to realize philosophy. Some of the people I had seen, I really felt that they really had reached. Really, I felt in their very being 
uh, we had a teacher who once had been very, very well known. But when we